Our next speaker is Chrissy Testison. Chrissy is a student, I guess you could say we recruited. <laughs> Chrissy didn't finish her application uh, by the end of the deadline, and we saw her application, not because she couldn't finish it or, or isn't good with deadlines, um, but we noticed her application and thought it was really strong, and so we called her and asked her to finish her application, and, sh and she did. Um, since getting here, she has really soaked up every minute of it. She has volunteered in Scripps Labs, including Greg Rouse's lab, and at Southwest Fisheries. She's taken the scientific diving class and the boating course. Um, she's learned how to extract DNA. She's sorted through plankton samples looking for lobster larvae, and she's crafted stories for citizen science. The title of her talk today is Here Be Dragons. Tracking Sea Dragons in Australia Through Community Science and the Art of Underwater Photography. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Samantha, for changing my life with a phone call last year. <laughs> um, so my capstone project has focused on building a community science website to support research on sea dragon populations and inform more effective conservation measures for their habitats. So sea dragons are the elegant cousins of seahorses and pike fishes, and there are currently three known species pictured here. Um, in the top corner there is the weedy or common sea dragon, which has beautiful spot patterns over its body. In the middle is the leafy sea dragon with those beautiful flowing appendages. And at the bottom there is the ruby sea dragon, who was just discovered in 2015 by our very own Grey Grouse and team, um, and is a great reminder of how much we still have to discover about the ocean. So sea dragons are found only in Australian waters and make beautiful subjects for photographers, as well as very mysterious subjects for scientists. We still have a lot to learn about them. They are graceful masters of camouflage, both literally and metaphorically, with many basic questions about their lives still unanswered. For example, how far can an individual sea dragon range? How long does a wild sea dragon live? Are their populations contracting in response to a changing ocean? In other words, where are the dragons? <laughs> <laughs> to gather the data needed to begin answering the many open questions surrounding sea dragons, I set out to develop a, wa a website called Dragon Search, pictured here, um, with the goal to bring together skill sets from science, scuba diving, and underwater photography uh, to track individual wild sea dragons. So why track individual fish? We know where sea dragons have been collected historically, which is shown in this map here, um, but this data actually covers the past 150 years and so is not necessarily reflective of where current sea dragon populations are located, their current ranges. Um, we also now have a baseline understanding of the genetic connectivity between these populations. Um, but there are still many gaps in our understanding of how to manage them for conservation purposes. There has been anecdotal evidence that sea dragon populations have been contracting, which we think may be due to the impacts of climate change. But genetics research is not necessarily the optimal tool for studying something like this. It takes a fair amount of effort and expense to get genetic data, and we may be seeing things change more quickly than genetic tracking can reveal. At the same time, sea dragons are so sought after by photographers and ocean enthusiasts, why not utilize that popularity and involve the public? My committee members and mentors, Dr. Greg Rouse and Dr. Narita Wilson, had begun crafting a vision last year for the use of sea dragon photographs as data. And I joined them this past winter to help make that vision a reality. We knew that cameras love sea dragons and that this opened the door to a whole new kind of data. So wildlife photography has been emerging as an innovative and potentially less invasive way of collecting data to answer scientific questions. When photographs are paired with artificial intelligence, individual animals can be identified and tracked through time and space. The nonprofit WildMe has been a leader in developing software for these types of projects. 
So my first step in making the Sea Dragon Initiative a reality was to establish a contract with the leader of Wild Me, Jason Holmberg, for developing Sea Dragon specific software. Jason has already successfully launched these types of projects for other marine species, like the ones pictured here. Uh, and what he does is use the patterns on the animal's bodies to identify individuals, kind of like facial recognition or a fingerprint. And there's a good example with the whale shark in the corner there. You can see kind of a connect the dots thing. So after establishing our contract with Wild Me, the next step was to source literally thousands of photos of both leafy and common sea dragons to begin training our machine learning algorithm. Um, Jason, Nerida, and I spent many, many hours drawing bounding boxes like the one that you see here so that we could teach the computer what a sea dragon is. So we would draw these boxes around their bodies and their heads to distinguish them from the background. Um, we worked with a variety of photos with different angles, lighting, and backgrounds to give the computer a rigorous and well-rounded education. <laughs> Training has been going very well, and the algorithm currently finds sea dragon bodies and heads with 92% accuracy, classifies species with 84% accuracy, and factors in different viewpoints, like the top right or the bottom right, with 94% accuracy, which in the world of AI is really good. This is not a sea dragon, um, <laughs> but uh, this cheetah is um, an example of what we will be doing next, which is looking to see um, how the artificial intelligence does with actually matching individuals. Um, so this is a visual of what the computer is trying to do when it matches body patterns from different photographs. So for example, if we have Bob the cheetah here and he turns up in one photograph in March and then he turns up in another photograph in July, the computer wants to know that both of those data points are in fact Bob. So that's where we're at with the machine learning. Um, and while that has been a critical piece of the project, it has also been important to establish the website itself as an engaging space for education and community building. Our goal is to engage contributors and partners for the long term. So that's what I had in mind while designing our landing site, which is pictured here. And these past few months, I learned a lot more about citizen and community science projects. And I realized how important it was going to be for our project to be a living collaboration between those in the water and those in the lab. And the project I knew was going to kind of come to life by connecting contributors to the work that they would be supporting, I give them meaningful feedback about the data that they're contributing, and educate them to be responsible marine stewards. We want our contributors to be knowledgeable team members who understand what the data that they help collect helps researchers like Greg and Nerida to uncover about the lives of sea dragons. Science communication plays an important role here, and I plan to use website news stories, social media, possibly a newsletter, to keep our contributors engaged with research outcomes, um, such as the previous work pictured here from Greg and Nerida. Another important task of education is empowering participants to interact responsibly with marine life. Though photography is typically seen as a less invasive way to collect data, there is still a risk of stress stressing the fish with things like blinding camera flashes and overly enthusiastic chasing of the sea dragons. So we want to minimize those things and we want to ensure that our project is as low impact as possible. Um, so I'm working on adapting and implementing this code of conduct, which we actually sourced from a past Sea Dragon survey project. We also intend to cultivate some healthy competition and camaraderie amongst our contributors through features like a leaderboard, uh, a real-time map of confirmed sightings, um, updated uh, reports about recent sightings and encounters, and profiles of our regular contributors. Um, this example is from Wild Book for Whale Sharks, which is already live, but similar features are under development for a dragon search as we speak. So coming back to Dragon Search, once a participant has moved through the education and engagement features of the landing page, which we saw before, they will be redirected to this Wildbook page to actually submit their data, share their photographs. 
Um, the Wild Book page is still under construction. This is a template that we are adapting, so you won't actually be able to adopt a shark through our project, but <laughs> maybe Crystal can tell you where you can do that. Um, but you will be able to share data about sea dragons um, by clicking on Report an Encounter which, there we go, <laughs> clicking on report an encounter and then it will take you to a page that looks like this where you can share photographs, location data, other types of data that are relevant and helpful for our researchers and create new records. So coming back to the world of humans, um, another important result of the past few months' work has been the foundation that we've been building for partnerships and collaborations, because this is what is really going to drive this project for the long haul. Um, divers like Craig Lebin and Steve Norris, uh, Craig is in the upper left and Steve is leaning out there in the bottom corner, they have, divers like them, have helped us to gather almost 4,000 photos of common and leafy sea dragons to train our machine learning algorithm. So truly this project would not be possible without them. Um, it would also not be possible without our lovely donor, Miss Dewey White, um, who brings possibility and style to our project and who has made the whole thing possible. That's her in Australia getting ready to dive with the dragons. And of course, at the core of all of this, the core team, upper corner on the right, um, and the two people on the far left, Greg Grouse and Nerida Wilson, who have laid the foundation for Sea Dragon research. They've also guided me personally through every scientific nuance of this project and continue to do so. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, one of our main priorities going forward is to continue building out this team, collaborating with scientists, collaborating with divers, with sea dragon enthusiasts of all kinds. So speaking of our long-term goals, um, ultimately with Dragon Search, we want to collect data over a 10-year period. Um, so we really do want to engage people for the long term. And we plan to use the data that we collect for the conservation of sea dragons themselves, but also to inform us about the habitats that they are an integral part of. Sea dragons might be able to act as indicators for the health of their habitats, alerting scientists and conservation managers to changes that will impact not only sea dragons, but also the many other species who are reliant on these habitats. So sea dragons have this really unique potential to act as ambassadors for their corner of the ocean. And though we have made a lot of progress, some elements of Dragon Search are still under development. So I will be continuing to work with Greg, Nerida, and Jason, moving on forward through the summer um, to keep working on this and plan for a full launch in September, which also happens to be springtime in Australia and the kickoff to dive season. So it's perfect timing. Um, I will keep working on the website and outreach plans through July and August. Then in September, Greg and I will travel to Australia to join Narada and do outreach and engagement on the ground there. So it's exciting to show you what we've done so far, but I also want to say just wait because Australian springtime is coming. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I just want to highlight really quickly my thanks to a few particular people, um, Nerida and Jason, my committee members, who are the best team in the world to coordinate international Skype meetings with. Um, Dewey, again, has brought so much fun and style and passion to the project and made it possible. Samantha, obviously, phone call, that is why I'm standing here today. Um, and more and above all else, uh, the one and only Professor Greg Rouse, who has been my capstone chair and mentor this year. He is the actor. <laughs> Greg is the actual father of sea dragons. Um, on top of that, his generosity is absolutely endless, and he's given me opportunities this year that have completely changed my life. So thank you, Greg. And I will now take any questions. <laughs> Erica. Um, I see within the dragon search you want to track the common, oh, <laughs> the common and leafy sea dragons, but um, we'll also track ruby. 
Great question. Yes, I didn't have time to get to that. Um, yes, so ruby sea dragons we have very few records of since they were just recently discovered, but there will be an opportunity on the website to contribute rec records of rubies that have been washed up on the beach. Unfortunately, those are dead ruby sea dragons, but they are still data. So they're still useful to us. Um, they won't be part of the AI and the facial recogn uh, pattern recognition, but uh, location records of where they've been washed up on the beach. Mom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what is it that makes the ruby sea dragon different is in terms of how much you've been able to track it or um, you know, well, find it? Yeah, great question. Um, mostly because it's been so recently discovered and it also lives a lot deeper than the other two. So the ruby is usually found uh, in the vicinity of 70 meters, which is beyond recreational scuba limits. Um, so most of their records have been uh, through dead beach washed ones and also some um, remote operated vehicle footage that Greg and Narita obtained. Um, so yeah, it's just they're not a species that divers encounter. Um, in the way that they encounter the other two, but hopefully that will evolve and we'll get more information about them as we go. Hi, Chrissy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you have a lot of questions. May I ask two quick ones? Sure. Okay. Adam. Uh, thank you. <laughs> All the questions uh, seem to be from the same section. Yeah, yeah. We're a v <laughs> VIP section. Wait, can we ask you questions about economics? Yeah, after? of course, yeah. So, Chrissy, I know we've been dating for a while now. <laughs> But I, I noticed that you didn't thank me in the slide. <laughs> That's my first question, what's going on? Uh, what's and then the next question? Then the next, we'll get to the next question. Uh, the next question is, uh, I went to Birch Aquarium this weekend, you know, with my parents, and, and we saw this incredible sea dragons exhibit. Um, is there any usefulness in, in aquarium photos for your project? Uh, that's a great question as well, and Thank another, you. another thing I didn't have time to get to. Um, yes, their aquarium photos are super useful for us for multiple reasons. Um, they help to continue to calibrate and train the machine learning, so the more photos that we get, the better. Um, also, they give us location records of where sea dragons are in aquariums, so uh, records of where captive sea dragons are. Um, and they can answer some questions about the science of how they live in captivity. So how long do they live when they're in an aquarium? Um, so similar questions, but in the captive setting. Um, and there will be options to submit aquarium data through Dragon Search as well.